can turn to Romans 7. We'll continue our studies there. But song, I'll be a friend of Jesus, is good if you mean it, but right? you ought to be careful not to be like Peter. If you recall, he said, though all offend, I will never be offended. And one of the other Gospels, he said, I'm ready to go with thee, both to prison and to death. Christ cut him down pretty quickly and said, well, before the cock crows, you're going to die three times, Peter. That's it. We ought to be a friend of Jesus, but let's be sure we are really a friend to him. Amen. Romans 7, we'll begin in verse 5. <laughs> if you recall, <laughs> I'll follow that. that. Romans chapter 7, verse 5 through 7, what we're going to look at today. He begins by saying, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now are ye delivered from the law, that being dead were we were held, that we should serve in newness of the spirit, and not in oldness of the letter. Amen. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Here no was tickled here today. <laughs> if you recall from our last lesson, we looked at how we are dead to the law, that we might be married to another, which is Christ. That is, we are no longer bound to the law, and it can no longer condemn us, it can no longer pronounce us guilty, it can no longer... Mm -hmm. Well, he could have no longer any dominion over us, for we are not under law, but under grace, as he says in chapter 6. But he begins here by <clears throat> comparing what we used to be to what we are now. He says, for when we were in the flesh, notice that it was past tense. When well, we speak to the saved here, the, when we were in the flesh, that is the old man, the old nature which we used to live by. Obviously, we're all here still in a body of flesh, but by the flesh, he means that old man, which before we were saved. Amen. That nature which we live by outside of Christ. If you're not saved, you are still in the flesh, and according to Romans chapter 8, verse 8, you cannot please God. Right. We'll get to that when we get to Romans 8, but that is a problem with all these workspace types, salvation, and things that you can do to earn your salvation or to be saved. You have to be born again before you can even begin to please God. Amen. Romans 8, verse 8 says very clearly, So then that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you are not saved here today, you are the servant of sin. You're right. But also you're bound to the law, which is a pretty dire situation because you can, in the sight of God, you must keep the law perfectly, but yet you, in your own state, cannot keep the law perfectly. All right. Really, outside of Christ, you are completely hopeless. Mm -hmm. But we, which were in the flesh, he says, we are no longer in the flesh, but when we were in the flesh, he says, the motions of sin, that is, the affections or the passions, if you will, of sin. Romans 5, 24 says that we have crucified, we have crucified the old man with the lusts and affections thereof, that's the same motions of sin here. Amen. You might say it's the Emotions are the feelings which stir up sin in us. Emotions of sin which were by the law. So it is the law which brings forth those things which are sinful in our lives. Not that the law causes us to sin, but the law shows us that. Amen. As you'll say here later on in our text, I had not known lust except the law had said. 
Thou shalt not covet. For when we were in the flesh, the motion of the sin which were by the law did work in our members and bring forth fruit unto death. That is, these motions of sin, as he calls it here, this, the wicked feelings that were deep down in within us, that those things bring forth the fruit of sin, which is death. Amen. Romans 6.23, we saw that recently, how the wages of sin is death. Romans 1, James 1.15, I'll mention that several times in our study today, but that says, When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Mm -hmm. Those lusts and passions of the flesh which work within us, they bring forth sin, and eventually the fruit of sin, which is death. If we go back to our lesson last time, we were there in verse 4, we were married to another that we should bring forth fruit unto God. In our unsaved condition, we bring forth fruit unto death, but if we are saved, we are to bring forth fruit unto God. Mm -hmm. From on verse 6, he says, But now we are delivered from the law. He says, notice he begins with, but now. That is, there is a, a change from what we were. Amen. Now we were in the flesh, building the lust and desires of the flesh, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. That we walked according to the course of this world, according to the principalities and the prince of power of the air. We were as the children of wrath. You know, that is those motions of sin which were in our members working forth the fruit of the death. That is those lusts and desires of the flesh that controlled us in our old life, if you will. Amen. He says, but now we are delivered from the law. That is, we are delivered from its dominion, if you will, its power, its, really its condemnation as well. Let's go back to our previous lesson because we are dead in Christ, we are dead to the law. Mm -hmm. For we, for but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. As we are dead to the law, this is the husband is dead to her husband, an example we saw last week, and because of that, she is free from her husband, so thus we are free from the law. Remember, we had to die in Christ that we could be made free from the law, that we might be united unto him. Amen. Again, if you have not died with Christ, then you are still bound to the law. <laughs> if you have not truly been born again with Christ, then you are still under the dominion of the law. Mm -hmm. And you will have to stand before God and give an account for that one day. But it's not going to be as many people think, and you know, you're, hopefully your good works can outweigh your bad works. You're going to be found in violation of all of God's law. Amen. But no, we that are saved, we have been freed from the law that we might live unto Christ. Right. That being dead, wherein you were held, we were. Once held, if you will, by the law, held in its dominion and held under its perfect requirements. And yet we could not keep those things. But now we are free from that, and he says that we should serve in newness of the spirit, and not in oldness of the letter. That we should serve. We still are required to serve God. Amen. That serve means to obey, to submit, it literally means to be a slave. Mm -hmm. and we are free from the law but we're still bound to serve God I think that's where many professing Christians get off today is they they act as if they're free to live however they want to but Right. we are still bound to serve God we're still really because he has saved us that ought to drive us to serve him and it says here in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. This is the difference between serving God because he has saved you and 
and serving God as some outward show of ordinances and commandments. Because we have newness of spirit, because he has made us a new creature in Christ, that should drive us to serve him. Mm -hmm. It was a, the Pharisees, they served God, but they served him in the sense of the oldness of the letter, didn't they? Right. Of course, they had their own commandments and traditions to it, but they had a very good outward display of keeping the commandments. And in fact, Paul, when he described his old self, he said he was as touching the law of blameless. But yet, the problem is that it didn't address the inward problem of the man. Right. So the driving force behind us serving God should be that he is saved. Not that we might earn something or that, not that we are necessarily afraid God's going to you know, quote with us if we don't listen to him. Certainly, we ought to fear God. Mm -hmm. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. That fear is not that we should be scared of him necessarily. We should serve God because of his goodness toward us, because of his grace and mercy upon us. Not to put on some outward show of the flesh. Right. I want us to turn over to Matthew for a minute. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll go over to Mark. Before, verse 27 28 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Mm -hmm. We know the command of was thou shalt not commit adultery. But as we'll see, really the commandments are just an outward. <laughs> Display of what's inward in man. Mm -hmm. No doubt the Jews condemned adultery, I think. But they didn't address the real issue of the heart. And that's what Christ addresses there in Matthew chapter 5. It's not just that you commit adultery, it's that you have lust in your heart. Right. See, lust is where sin always begins, isn't it? Mm -hmm. one fifteen, lust when we have conceived when we for sin. And that is where the difference between salvation by grace and salvation by works is. So salvation by grace addresses the real issue, which is the heart of man. Amen. Works <laughs> attempts to just put on some outward show, which really is not pleasing to God. Amen. To the Pharisees, they were very good at appearing righteous before men, but inwardly they were just like the sepulchers, weren't they? They appeared very beautiful outward, but yet inwardly they were full of dead men's bones. Right. And they were like when you wash a cup, if you just wash the outside, it looks real good, but if you don't wash the inside, it's not much useful, is it? Let's go over to Mark chapter 7, and Acts chapter Kind of what he is addressing here in Mark. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. They had accused, or really they were questioning why Jesus and his disciples were eating with unwashed hands. And he told them, well, it's not what goes in the mouth of the files of man. Was what comes out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23 says, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For with, from within, out of the heart of men, perceive evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. 
All these things come from within and defile the man. Amen. See, that is what we need to address even in our own lives. Is what's within a man, not what comes out of man is just the inward expression of what's, or excuse me, the outward expression of what's inside the man. You know, murder we know is sin, but really murder is just a symptom of the hatred which is within man. Right. You know, greed is in trying to love <laughs> or to stockpile money because comes from the love of those things, doesn't it? A man seeks after possessions and money and fame and all these things because of the lust that is within his heart. And we can say, thou shalt do this and thou shalt do not do that all day long. But the problem is man's heart is wicked. Mm -hmm. it was, I think it's good that we should have the commandments. We'll see the commandments are good and holy and just. Verse 12 of chapter Romans 7 tells us, but yet the commandments, the law, they cannot give life. They cannot make one right in the sight of God because the heart is the real issue. You know, serving God in newness of the Spirit is because He has given, He has made us a new creature, not because we are trying to put on some outward display of righteousness. I'm afraid that many Christians try to do that, though, don't they? Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, you're serving him in the oldness of the letter. <laughs> that letter refers to the Old Testament primarily, the scriptures. That's how it's translated in other places. We are to serve him because he has made us a new creature, not, not just because he said, do this and do that. On the other hand, we shouldn't, we don't serve a newness of the Spirit by just doing what we, quote, feel led to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we have people that live by that motto today. Right. right. Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We are, we certainly we should follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but he gives the very clear commands that we are to follow as well in his word. Why we follow his word is really the ultimate test, if you will, if you're serving God correctly or not. So are you doing it because you're feel obligated to, or do you do it because you love God? Are you serving him because it's what's expected of you, or because you want to look good before your fellow brothers and sisters, or do you want to or do you serve him because you have a desire to please him? That we can only see the outward display of doing what the commandments say, but each one of us must examine ourselves to see whether our heart is right before him. Amen. That is one thing that I can't do, but Larry can't do, only you can do for yourself. Amen. Let's go on to verse 7 back in our text here. Romans 7, verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Paul brings this, asks this question anytime he knows there's objections to something he just wrote. And this is the third time out of five that he'll do it in the book of Romans. What shall we say then? Does the law sin? And he knows that someone's going to say, well, the law must be sinful then because, because of what he had just said, because the law is what showed us our, what stirs up sin in our hearts. No, the law is not sin. Really, this is the law of sin, the beginning of the thoughts of the rest of the chapter. Verse 12 tells us though that the law is holy, and as I mentioned earlier, the commandment is holy, just, and good. The problem is not with the law, but it's with us as sinful creatures. If nothing else, we ought to remember that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Galatians 3.24 tells us. Amen. See, the law shows us our seeing sinfulness. And I think 
That's why so many despise the law of God today. For the law tells us exactly what we are, and man doesn't like that very much. So man likes to think that he is pretty good, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Man likes to think that he is okay, that somehow he is going to be good enough when he stands before God. But the law, when you get down to it, it really shows us what we really are. Amen. It shows us our exceeding sinfulness. Really, it exposes our inability to even keep it. <laughs> That's why it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and pointed us to our need for a Savior. Mm -hmm. I don't know how anyone can look at the law and say, oh yeah, I'm okay. Because <laughs> when you really examine yourself in the light of the law of God, you will find yourself very, very far short of what is expected. And with the law saying the answer is God forbid. Absolutely not. The law most definitely is not sin, but rather it shows us our exceeding sinfulness. Amen. As we see next, he says, Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. So what is sin? First John 3 4 tells us that sin is trans sin is a transgression of law. That is really goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, sin is the breaking of God's commandments. Mm -hmm. They have one commandment, not to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, Eve, being deceived by the serpent, took it, and Adam, full knowingly, took and ate of it. Mm -hmm. And we all plunged into sin. But sin has not changed in its definition even to today. It's still the breaking of God's commandments. And it's in the light of this law that we see our sinfulness. And that's why I think it's, a, it's important to preach the sinfulness of man, showing mm -hmm. his need for a Savior. Amen. Why did Christ come to save his people from their sins, he says. Well, I know the Holy Spirit has to open each one's heart to see that, but Man needs to see that he is a sinner in need of a savior. Amen. You know, I think that's why prosperity preaching is so popular today because it tells about all that how good man is and about all that man can attain materialistically. Right. But what the scriptures say is that man is wicked and sinful in the sight of God. And Amen. Apart from Christ. You'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. Without Christ, you are without hope, mm -hmm. Jesus tells us. And that is what man needs to hear, whether he likes it or not. Amen. God has this perfect standard for righteousness, and yet man cannot keep it as much as he may want to, as much as he may strive to. James tells us that to break the least of the commandments is to be guilty of all. Mm -hmm. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. You know, the law says, for example, thou shalt not steal. So if a person steals, he knows he has broken the law. Even when we talk about secular laws, you know, the law says you shouldn't do something, then you break it. You're now guilty of breaking that law. Whether, you know, we know the law says you can't run a stop sign, so you get down here at the, in the road and run through the stop sign, you're guilty of breaking the law. Right. But there was no law that said thou shalt not, uh, if there was no law that said that you can't run a stop sign, you wouldn't be guilty of breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Even though it says stop, even though you know what stop means, but it was the law of God. He says very clearly to do and to not do, and yet man breaks those laws. Therefore, man can very clearly see that he is a sinner in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. But really, that's only the said only really the surface level of it, if you will, because 
Our sin is only just the outward manifestation of what's really within us. Why do we steal and murder and do all these other type of things? It's because of the wickedness that is within man. Mm-hmm. Stealing oftentimes comes from lusting for things that we shouldn't, that we don't need, or we <laughs> lusting for things that aren't ours. Murder stems from the hatred which is in the heart of man. Mm-hmm. Adultery often stems from lusting after another woman. That's how it begins, as we saw there in Matthew chapter 5. Right. <coughs> and that is a problem that needs to be addressed within man. Because man is a murderer, man is a thief, man is a liar, man does these things, but <laughs> man will continue to be those things until his heart is fixed, if you will. Mm-hmm. Until he is given that new heart that God says he will give he goes on to say there, back in our text, for I have not known sin to my law, for I have not known lust, except the law that said, Thou shalt not covet. For I have not known lust, I know we often think of lust as sexual desires that are not morally good. We are, or sometimes we think of greed when we think of lust, but really lust covers any evil desires. We desire anything that we shouldn't. We are guilty of lust. Mm-hmm. The Israelites often lusted after other gods. We today are very prone to lust after things in our modern American society. I know men lust after different things than women do oftentimes, but yet lust is the beginning of our sin problem. Mm-hmm. I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Which is Exodus 20 17 tells us very clearly, Thou shalt not covet. And gives examples of Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife his, or his donkey or any of these other things that list there. But even covetousness is really an outward show of the inward problem that lust is within us. Paul, until he was. <clears throat> Confronted by this law, he did not, he could not understand the inward problem that was within him. Amen. It was kind of like when a little kid wants to touch a hot stove. You tell them no, they don't really understand why at the time, do they? Right. Now well, maybe they'll learn if they reach up there and touch it. But we often reach out and touch sin, don't we? And we, we don't learn our lesson the first time. As a good parent, you say, no, don't touch that. And they know not to touch it. They do it anyway, then they're breaking your command. Amen. It's really a, even just that little example is a display of what our inward mischievousness as human beings. Mm-hmm. Do the, all the commands, really. They address the outward expression of our sin, but the law does not address the inward problem. And that is, a, as we'll see, I think it's in chapter 8, that is really what the problem with the law was, that it could not perfect the flesh. Only Christ can give us a new creature. Only through Christ can we be given that new heart and a new spirit that we might serve God. But, until then, if you just are trying to keep the commandments to please God, you are not addressing the real problem. Right. So we can only see the outward manifestation of other people's sins. So we can see within our own hearts whether we are right with God or not. And ultimately, the Word of God, that will show you who you really are. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. Lighting under the, the joints of the marrow, even <coughs> as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's where the Word of God really gets 
down to who you really are. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts and intents of your heart? You know, right? For example, Brother Max Stewart, I believe he was a saved man. I appreciate him very much. He actually gave him a very first job I ever had. You know, I would talk and fellowship with him there at Sunnyview anytime he was here. But ultimately, I could not know his heart. Right. I'm sure as much as Brother Larry would like to know each and every one of our hearts, he could not know any more than I could know yours. Right. <clears throat> from within a man that's what defiles a man what comes out of the mouth is what defiles a man not, not what we put in as Christ said but all that wickedness that comes out of us that's the sign of a spiritual problem within us that is just another reason why I have questions about people who say they've been saved and yet never live a changed life amen because if God makes a new creature within you, then that will be evident in your life. If you're still wicked inside, you've never been made that new creature, you've never been born again, that wickedness will still show its way out. Amen. So, the Word of God, that will show you who you really are. Right. Whether you're saved or whether you're not. <laughs> Whether you ever made a profession of faith or whether you haven't, examine yourself to the Word of God and you'll see if you're really what you say you are. Amen. So, because the law will show you your exceeding sinfulness. You know, and it should point you to Christ. It should point you to show you that you need a Savior, that you cannot save yourself. But you can try to keep the commands the best of your ability, but you will still be found lacking when you stand before God. Mm -hmm. well, certainly, we ought to serve Him if He has saved us. In fact, that's what the Paul was saying back there in verse 6 that we should serve in newness of the Spirit. But let us not serve Him just because that's what's expected of us or because that's we feel obligated to whether we should serve him because he has made us a new creature because he has taken that sinful nature out of us and give us a new spirit a new creature a new man if you will amen i woke up as we get on farther in chapter seven we'll see that we still will struggle with the old man versus the new man but The thoughts and intents of your heart, that is what determines ultimately whether you are serving him correctly or not. Amen. Let's go ahead and close with that thought.